Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. We're continuing with Open Forum this hour. Open Forum, open to you, open to anybody. 888-318-7884 is the number. Let me just check. I'll check the lines. I'll tell you how many uh, lines are. Oh, there's two lines open, so this is a good time to call because when Jimmy's here, there's, it's rare that there's more than a line open. 888-318-7884. You have a question about the Catholic faith, a question about the Bible. You got a question about Jesus, maybe about the sacraments. All welcome. Got a moral or philosophical question, a scientific question. You want to talk to Jimmy Aiken? 888-318-7884. There's two lines open right now, and they will be filled shortly, I am sure. Jimmy, of course, a senior apologist here at Catholic Answers, the author of A Daily Defense, 365 Days Plus One to Becoming a Better Apologist, and the proprietor of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, thank you for being back for another hour. My pleasure, Cy Kellett. Thank you for being back for another hour, because otherwise I'd have to host this alone. I, I, I can't allow that, Jimmy. I have, mm -hmm. I, I, I have to, like, I, what if someone hears that and goes, mm, that seemed fine. We don't, I don't know if we need the other guy anymore. Then that's not going to be good for me. I don't, okay. I, I don't need that. <laughs> uh, but you're going to be uh, back with us uh, tomorrow uh, through the magic of time travel. We're going to yeah, do yeah, that's right. Two hours of weird questions. Yeah, and since you mentioned time travel, of course, in this case, what that amounts to is we recorded it already. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. We recorded it uh, because I will not be here. I will be on an airplane to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm disappointed that you're going to be that close and not come visit me. I apologize you're only for that. Only a couple that. hours away. I know but it's very quick. I'm not only going to be in Tulsa for I I, I counted the hours 17 hours, mm -hmm. and uh, you know my sleep. You can I'm, count that high. I can, I can, and I'm great. And, I know how averse you are to doing math on the air. Well, I have to get my 11 hours of sleep too. So I don't know what's mm -hmm. 17 minus 11. I, that's like two or three hours left. I don't. I can't do that math. But uh, so uh, I, I. But I'm gonna. I, I've, I, now that I know how mm -hmm. close Oklahoma and Arkansas are, and they're very close. They're that's next what, door to each other. Yeah, that's yeah, close. They, they actually touch. They I, share a border. This is, I'm just saying this is new information for me. I, was, mm -hmm. I hadn't memorized that portion of the map yet. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, when I, 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 I will make uh, – I'll just ask uh, Jen to extend me for a day or something and come and visit you. i got to see the, the new um, mansion. In the yeah. Arkansas, <laughs> the I can mansion. show you some mansions, but I don't own one. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm sorry about that. I don't even. You, Carlo's in Tulsa, and I don't even know if I'm going to see Carlo. It's mm -hmm. going to be such a quick uh, thing. So, is he Tulsa know. or Oklahoma City? No, he's Tulsa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I'm being Broken Arrow. I like that name, mm -hmm. Broken Arrow. Yeah. I mean, I, I like There's Tulsa also, and everything. But. You know what else there is in Oklahoma? Broken Bow. So you can have your broken arrow, and you can have your broken bow. I had no idea. What's the? Mm -hmm. Were people just not taking care of their equipment? Why? What? What's I going think on? A, <laughs> think it's a symbol of peace. Oh, oh, I get it now. Yeah, you break the arrow, you break the bow. That moves, means we're not we're not at war and anymore. You oh, beat yeah. those beat those swords into the pruning hooks yeah, and don't right. learn war anymore. Uh, if I had a ham, oh, I don't know. That's the wrong song. I apologize. 888-318-7884 is the number. It's open forum. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. Uh, James in Florida, uh, you are next. Thank you very much for the call, James. Go ahead with your question. Um, hello, yes. Um, I was calling. I had a question on the existence of hell, if there was okay. any evidence that there is a hell. Well, what kind of evidence are you looking for? Biblical uh, evidence, traditional evidence, magisterial evidence, or empirical evidence? Um, traditional evidence, I guess you could say. Okay. Well, so tradition is expressed in, for example, the writings of the Church Fathers. And if you read the writings of the Church Fathers, they are of the majority opinion that there is a hell. Um, there are a, a very small number of Church Fathers who, who would dispute that. Um, 
but the overwhelming number of church fathers uh, believe that hell was a real place that humans could go, and I have a whole chapter about that in my book, The Fathers Know Best. So if traditional evidence is the only kind you're interested in, or even if it's not, we'll see about sending you a copy of The Fathers Know Best, sure. but I want, I want to make sure that there aren't other forms of evidence you're looking for, because I can name other forms. Uh, James? We, oh, James, you know what? I messed up on the phones. Go, d- d- was there other evidence you were looking for, James? Um, also empirical evidence, if there was any. Okay, there is empirical evidence for the existence of hell. It, beginning in uh, 1975, uh, a, a researcher named Raymond Moody published a book called Life After Life in which he investigated really for the first time in a systematic way what are now known as near-death experiences. That's actually a term that Moody coined. And even though a large number of near-death experiences are reported as being happy and blissful, they ain't all that way. In fact, even in the very first book on near-death experiences, Life After Life, uh, Raymond Moody uh, reported that there were near-death experiences of a negative nature, particularly in cases where people had committed suicide. And the people who got to come back from these near-death experiences, you know, said, I realized as soon as I was dead that I'd done something wrong, that it was wrong of me to take my life, and it would have been wrong of me to take someone else's life, and I was going to have to suffer for a long time. Now, that doesn't mean they were actually in hell it could also be purgatory because suicide is not an automatic sentence to hell um but there are subsequent to life after life there have been uh a significant number of negative near-death experiences that have been reported um for a long time they've been understudied and there are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is near-death experience researchers have not really wanted to look into them because they're disturbing and it, it disrupts the happy afterlife narrative that they're interested in. So they really haven't been looking for negative ones. Fortunately, that started to change. There are now near-death experience researchers who do look at the negative experiences. And the second reason that they've been understudied is people who've had them don't usually like talking about them. You know, it's it's a sensitive matter to say, you know, I died and I think I went to hell. People don't like saying that. These can be very disturbing experiences. And so people who've had negative near-death experiences can be very reluctant to talk about them. Fortunately, Um, There are uh, ways uh, that they can talk about them in a safe and and supportive environment, and they can, you know, find peace and figure out what they need to do. I actually have an episode of Mysterious World that's coming up um, about negative near-death experiences. Um, It's going to be the first episode in the new year, so it's going to be coming out on uh, January 5th. It's episode 292, and we will be looking at at what's been reported about negative near-death experiences and um, the different ways of interpreting them. I don't think actually all of the negative ones are visions of hell, but they do count as evidence, many of them, that can point in that direction. And they're more common than a lot of people realize. Uh, Depending on the study you look at, as many as one in five or one in four near-death experiences, maybe even more than that, turns out to be negative, but people just don't want to talk about them. But we know it's at least something like one in five or one in four. So um, so check out that episode when it comes out, and it'll give you an overview of the of the evidence we have of an empirical nature uh, pointing to negative hell-like experiences in the afterlife. James, thank you for the call. If you hang on, we'll get your address and send you The Fathers Know Best, Jimmy's book, The Fathers Know Best. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Let us help you with your question today on Catholic Answers Live. Do you have a question but prefer to ask it privately? Catholic Questions can help. 
Go to catholicquestions.com to ask your question online, email us, drop us a letter, or give us a call. Longtime Catholic Answers Live apologist and author Jim Blackburn or another Catholic Questions apologist will be happy to assist you. Catholic Questions proudly supports Catholic Answers Live. So visit us at catholicquestions.com today. That's catholicquestions.com. The power of prayer simply means that words have an effect. For example, when a couple says, I do, it literally changes two people to becoming one in marriage. When you say, I love you, it changes us and it gives us value. The power of prayer is in the words and in the sentiment, but it's also in the fact that God, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, answers our prayers. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken, our guest. Open forum today, 888-318-7884. Anonymous is in Ohio watching on YouTube. Anonymous, uh, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hello. Um, I was wondering if it's immoral to or sinful to play audio or video of somebody saying Jesus's or the Lord's or God's name in vain. Because almost as if maybe you are doing it while you play that audio. Hmm. Okay, so um, taking the Lord's name in vain or misusing the Lord's name is, uh, you know, contrary to the Ten Commandments. And now that's a, there's a, it's a bit of a fuzzy category, but it covers a whole realm of negative speech acts, of speech acts that are immoral. Like, for example, blaspheming God, contradicting, you know, saying bad things about God or lying about what God says. That's another form of blasphemy um, because you're misrepresenting God to other people. Cy Kellett, um, can you think of anybody in the Bible who who says bad things about God or misrepresents God? Yes. Yeah, who would that be? Uh, uh, Just like one person? Well, uh, so a, a prominent example, let's say. A prominent example, okay, of someone who <laughs> all I can think of is is in Jesus's life, like the Pharisees and that kind of thing. But okay. that's not what you're looking for, I don't think. Not in this case, but you're in the ballpark. It is someone that appears in the Gospels. Oh, Satan. Yeah, how about that guy? <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry, Pharisees. Okay, so <laughs> should have gone with he, Satan he, first. <laughs> he says he says bad stuff about God. He's he's misusing the concept of God. He lies about things God has said. He's committing immoral speech acts connected with God. Can you read the Gospels, Psychelet? I can indeed. Yes, and I do. Okay. Are you sharing in Satan's sin when you read about Satan's sin? No. 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 So uh, so what so what we've seen here is people can commit immoral speech acts connected with God that nevertheless a a person reading the gospels does not participate in. In the same way, Psychelic, could you watch a movie or listen to an audiobook of the Gospels where Satan commits immoral speech acts connected with God. Yes, of course, yes. Yeah, so people can, without sin, watch video or listen to audio or read text where people do bad stuff, including immoral speech acts connected with God. So, uh, Anonymous, uh, merely watching a movie or listening to a book where people are misusing Jesus' name does not make you complicit in their sin, and therefore you are not sinning merely by consuming such media any more than you would be by reading the temptation of Christ in the Bible. Does that make sense to you, Anonymous? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much for the call. Uh, We'll go to, uh, yeah, we can go Chris in Connecticut now, watching on YouTube. Chris, thank you for your call. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, I think you're the guy. So this relates to Mary's perpetual virginity, particularly with the James. So we know we got two, the two apostles, James the Greater, James the Lesser. Mm -hmm. The dispute is, is if James the Lesser is the same person as James known as brother of the Lord. Now, I, I've been reading a lot of church uh, 
writers there in the early, in the early church, and um, I can't find any saying that there's three James, unless you know you know of any, and particularly like Eusebius and a lot of other popular ones, they're only talking about two James. Now, why would they ignore a third James if there was? Wouldn't there be a distinguishable between James, known as brother and lord, and James, son of Alphaeus, the lesser? Okay, so um, th- this this gets us into a complex territory, and I'm going to recommend a resource uh, that goes into it in, in quite a lot of detail before I give you my answer. The resource is a book called Jude and the Relatives of Jesus. It's by a British scholar named Richard Baucom, B-A-U-C-K-H-A-M. And it's got an essay, a lengthy essay in it on um, on the perpetual virginity of Mary and and how the different Jameses connect up and so forth. The reason that this issue is dealt with there is because the argument that um, that there's that James the less and James the brother of the, of the Lord are the same person is connected with which women including the mother of James, son of Alphaeus, who are present at the foot of the cross and how many women there are. So that's why it shows up in that context. Um, The idea that they're the same person appears to be driven by a particular theory of Mary's perpetual virginity, namely the theory that the so-called brethren of Christ were his cousins or some other close relations, but not step children through Joseph. Um, The alternative, which is actually the earliest theory of Mary's perpetual virginity uh, that we have on record, is that Joseph was an elderly widower who, um, who already had a family, which is why he was willing to become the guardian of a consecrated virgin like Mary. And so, consequently, the so-called brethren of the Lord are step children or foster brothers through Joseph. And this is the view, like I said, it's the earliest view. It appears in the mid-2nd century in Christian literature. It predates the other cousin theory, and it's always been the dominant theory in the East. The uh, cousin theory became prominent in the West chiefly through the influence of Jerome. And, and and it seems to be that theory seems to be the driving theory behind the James the Less or James son of Alphaeus and James the brother of the Lord are the same guy. It's what drives that theory. Having said all that, I think that the, that that theory is just mistaken. It it does not fit the biblical data for several reasons. To give you a brief look at that data, um, if the most famous thing about James, the brother of the Lord, whatever brother means, whether it means, you know, stepbrother or whether it means, um, you know, cousin. uh, The most famous thing about James, the brother of the Lord is he's the brother of the Lord. That's why he gets called that. That is the singular thing about him that that is the most famous fact about him. He's the guy that's the brother of the Lord. So it wouldn't make any sense to call someone else something else, like James the Less. In Greek, it's James ha mikros, which means the short or the little or the young. And the fact that this other James was short or little or young would not be the most prominent thing about him if he was the brother of the Lord. In fact, it would be insulting <clears throat> to point out things like, oh yeah, the brother of the Lord, that's the young one, or that's the short one. So he would consistently be referred to as the brother of the Lord if that's what he was. So that's one problem with this theory. The other problem with the theory, or another problem with the theory, is that we've got these two Jameses who are members of the Twelve. We've got James the son of Zebedee, and James the Less, or James the Short, or James the Young, or James the son of Alphaeus. And and so um, they're both Psychelet. Yes. These these two Jameses being among the twelve disciples. Yes. Were they believers in Jesus? They had to be, yes. 
Yeah, they had to be. You know who John says was not believers of G- in Jesus during his ministry? Oh, that's right. Uh, James, the brother of the Lord. Well, he says the brethren of Christ yeah, were yeah. Not, did not believe in him during his ministry. So it's scarcely likely that the most famous of all the brothers right. was among the most famous of all the disciples during Jesus' ministry. Right. So the, the mere fact that we know the brethren were not believers in Jesus during his ministry means we're not going to have one of them among the 12 disciples. Also, third piece of data, of these two disciples among the 12, yeah. um, which is the more famous one? Is it James, son of Zebedee, or James the less? Zebedee. James, son of and, Zebedee, yeah. And which one of them was closer to Jesus and in the core disciples, and which wasn't? Yeah, James, son of Zebedee is one of the core four. Yeah, but not James the less. No. So if, if, uh, if Jesus' own brother whatever that means, had been among the 12 disciples, he should be the most prominent James, and he's not. So I think we've got multiple lines of evidence indicating that James the Less is not the same person as James the brother of the Lord, and I also think that the Eastern theory of Mary's perpetual virginity, that the brethren were stepbrothers rather than cousins, is is the better supported by the evidence. But for more on that, Chris, you can, uh, you can check out uh, Jude and the Relatives of Jesus by Richard Baucom. Uh, Chris, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, we've got time to get another call on before we have to take the break, so off we go to Long Island, New York. Uh, Gil, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Gil, welcome back. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Okay, I hope you get me after the break, because this is an interesting question I have. I'm reading a book by uh, Rick Warren, a very good book called The Purpose Driven Life, where he says, your parents may not have planned you, but God did. You are not an accident. And it says, long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. In other words, he thought of you first. In light of that um, great quotation, um, I want to know exactly... um, when my girlfriend was alive, Nancy, and we dated and all that, and her life was changed when she met me when I told her about Jesus, and one day her life changed so completely. Um, is it possible, like I was telling her when we were dating a lot of times, sometimes I said, um, God knew you by name and God knew me by name. Is it possible to really say that God knew that I was going to date Nancy before we were even born, before we even existed? Is that, okay, it so, that? So, so properly speaking, God is outside of time, and therefore terms like before and after don't really apply to God in a literal sense. He sees all of history occurring in front of him at once. Um, that means that from our perspective— in, in let's say, the year 1800. Um, if you asked God, what's going to happen in the year 2200? God would be able to tell you in 1800 what, hap- what will happen in 2200, because he sees it. 2200 is just as real to him as 1800 is. And so we ex- sometimes express that by saying God knew ahead of time, because that's what it looks like to us. In 1800, God can tell you what's going to happen in 2200. That looks like God knows the future. Properly speaking, though, God is outside of all time, and so he sees all of time happening at once in front of him. So that's a more proper way of speaking. You can say, in this looser, accommodated sense, that God knew you were going to date your girlfriend and so forth. Properly speaking, though, God, being outside of time, saw every moment of your life and your girlfriend's life and everybody else's lives, and he saw the two of you dating. So, in, from his perspective in the eternal now, so God always knows, and if you want to apply time terms to it, has always known and will always know about your relationship with your girlfriend. Uh, Gil, that work for you? Oh, hang on, Gil. Hang on, it's a quick sec. Uh, Darren, can you push one for me? Gil, yeah. does that work for you? Yes. Um, it, it works for me. So it, it's also true that he knew about when she was going to die and that she was going to get exposed to 9-11. You know, the, when they bombed the World Trade Center, she worked two blocks from the building. So 
so later he, on she had to use an oxygen machine. So I'm assuming God knew all that before she was he, born. He, he, yeah. he knew he knew all of that. He knows all of that in the eternal now and sees all of that happening in front of him. He allowed it so that he could, for mysterious reasons, but we know that he wouldn't have allowed it unless he was going to bring an equal or greater good out of it. And now that she's gone to be with him, he more than compensates her for anything she innocently suffered in this life by allowing her to have an eternal weight of glory and joy with him. Gil, thank you. I hope that that was helpful to you. Thank you very, very much for the call. We're coming uh, right up on the break. Tomorrow's a big day uh, for Jimmy Akin uh, answering people's questions because he's got patron questions on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and weird questions in the afternoon here. Uh, we're, we're doing two hours of weird questions with uh, Jimmy Akin. And I just happen to know, because sometimes I know these things, that in both of those programs, he will be answering at least one question about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's what's coming up tomorrow. Uh, but right now, we got Jimmy for another half hour. So if you got a question for Jimmy, you're welcome to call 888-318-7884. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Is relativism dead? It sure seems dead. Each day, new moral demands are made and they are presented to us as absolutes. Everything from transgender ideology to physician-assisted suicide is presented as a moral good that all right-thinking people must accept. But Catholic Answers' own Carlo Broussard says look deeper and you will see today's moralism is just relativism dressed up in new clothes. Carlo's eye-opening book, the new relativism shines a light on how the sacred moral teachings of this age cover up a deep denial of moral truth. Order your copy of The New Relativism today at shop.catholic.com and be prepared to defend the truth against aggressive relativism. The New Relativism at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. We'll help you start your day a better way with guests and topics that look at a variety of aspects of what it means to live our faith in everyday life. From scripture, catechesis, and church history to news, weather, and sports, hope you can join us. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. There it is, a little bit of groovy music for you. Nick checking the dead century. Jimmy Aiken is our guest this hour. It's open forum. And there's, let me see, there might be a, a one line open, 888-318-7884. Uh, back to the phones we will go. Taylor is in Iowa. Taylor, thank you very much for the call. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi. Um, so I'm new to the Catholic faith, and mm -hmm. um I I know a lot of just, like, Protestant people, and, like, they're, you know, trying to convince me, like, you know, why, like, the Pope is irrelevant, and I don't want to believe that, but I'm just, like, uneducated, so maybe you can enlighten me on that, like, why we have the Pope. Okay. Well, we ha the reason we have the Pope is because Jesus wanted us to. Um, he determined in the first century that his church needed a leader because he was going to be going back to heaven. You know, he wasn't going to be here to make decisions on earth and communicate those face to face with his disciples anymore, like he had during his earthly ministry. So once he went back to heaven, someone would need to 
to be able to be an effective leader in the church. And that person was St. Peter. And uh, we have actually multiple passages. It happens in three of the Gospels where Jesus indicates that St. Peter is the special leader. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, he tells him, you are Peter, and on this rock, that's rock is what the name Peter means, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So he's going to build his church on Peter. That doesn't mean other passages can't also use imagery about him building it on other things like the apostles. But in this passage, it means he's going to build it on Peter in a special sense. And he then says to Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing were terms for making and abolishing rules in in Judaism. And Jesus uses a, the singular here, not the plural. He means you, Peter, specifically, not you all as a group. Greek does have a word for y'all, and that's not what he's using in this passage. So in this passage, he means you, Peter, specifically, will be able to make or abolish rules in the church. So he's a leader. Um, then in uh, in Luke's gospel, at the at 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 the Last Supper, a dispute breaks out among the disciples about who of them is the greatest. You know who's the best. And Jesus says three things in response with no break. He says these three things: bang, bang, bang. First thing he says is that uh, Gentiles lord it over people. You know, they they act like big shots, but it shouldn't be that way among you. The greatest of you is the one who will serve the others. So he indicates the principle that Christian leadership needs to involve. It's not about being a big shot. It's about serving others and helping other people. Then the second thing he says is, I will, I, I will let you all, all 12 of you, sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So don't worry, you're all going to have prominent places in the kingdom. And then the third thing he says is, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, because all the disciples are going to run away when Jesus is arrested, when you have turned back, strengthen your brethren. So he gives Peter a special pastoral role to strengthen the other 12 disciples, the other members of the 12. So notice what he says in response to this, who is the greatest controversy. He First thing he says is, hey, if you want to be great, you need to serve. Don't worry, you're all going to have prominent places, but you, Peter, in particular, have a role of strengthening the other members of the 12. So once again, Peter is shown to be the leader. Then at the end of John's Gospel, um Jesus uh has uh has met meets with the disciples this is in John 21 he meets with the disciples at the sea of Galilee and he uh he because Peter denied him three times he walks Peter through a threefold confession of his love for Jesus and he says Peter do you love me and Peter says yes lord you know that i love you and Jesus says feed my sheep and he then does that a couple more times. But he keeps telling Peter, feed my sheep. Well, okay, who are the sheep? That includes all the other Christians, including the other members of the 12 disciples who are right there. So, uh, once again, we see Peter being appointed as the leader. And we have other passages that indicate Peter's leadership as well. In fact, there's a lot of them. But Jesus made the determination in the first century that his church would need leaders. That's why he appointed the Twelve. And he realized it would need one leader in particular. That's why he appointed Peter. So if the church needed that in the first century, when the church was just like, a few hundred people and later a few thousand people, it's certainly going to need leaders and a leader now that it has grown to be a, a billion people and incorporates one in six humans. It's going to need leadership and organization even more now than it did then. And that's why when Peter died, he left the Bishop of Rome as his successor, because he died in Rome, and so he left the Bishop of Rome as his successor, and that's why the Bishop of Rome is the Pope or the 
the equivalent of Peter in the modern church. If you'd like more information about that, we have a lot of information about all this on our website, catholic.com. Also on my website, jimmyakin.com, I have a paper that I wrote called Why Be Catholic? An Exercise for Evangelicals, where I go through this kind of stuff. And you can just use Google to find Why Be Catholic? An Exercise for Evangelicals by Jimmy Aiken, A-K-I-N, and look it up and read it, as well as all the stuff we have on catholic.com. Okay, Taylor? Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to have that conversation with you, and, and uh, welcome home to the Catholic Church. Uh, let's go to Patrick right here in San Diego, listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Patrick, thanks for downloading the app onto your phone. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, talking to one lady in one of my prayer groups, mm-hmm. and she was saying you're not supposed to receive the commun- uh, Eucharist in your hand, Mm-hmm. Because your hand's not consecrated. And then it mm-hmm. dawned on me, because I remember when I was a kid learning uh, that the priest's hands were consecrated, so you weren't supposed to touch it. So what happened to that? What were the, Are the priest's hands consecrated, or, or what, what about that? Well, okay, so let's approach this from a couple of different vantage points. Uh, Patrick, has your tongue been consecrated? No, no, no. no well, I, I mean, you, you that, could. I, you, you, I, you, I, you, I know. Hang on, Patrick. I need to get where I'm going. Um, actually, your tongue has been consecrated by baptism, just like all the rest of your body has. But your tongue, you're right, has not been specially consecrated to handle the Eucharist. It's not like, you know, at some. It's not like before your first communion, your priest reached into your mouth and grabbed your tongue and said a blessing over it. Um, so what that shows us is. Body parts don't have to be specially blessed in order to come into contact with the Eucharist. Now, can body parts be blessed to come into contact with the Eucharist? Sure. And my understanding is that under the old rite of ordination, the priest's hands were blessed that way. That's not part of what ordination is. You do, that's not an essential part of the rite, being ordained as a priest is what the right is, but as part of that right, they might have added this as a blessing, just because it's appropriate. But um, but it didn't mean back in the old day that a body part had to be blessed in order to come into contact with the Eucharist. Otherwise, priests could not have put the Eucharist on people's tongues, because their tongues were not specially blessed. So there's nothing wrong in principle with touching the Eucharist with other body parts, even if they're not blessed, like your hand. And in fact, there have been periods in church history where that was done. If you go back to the early church fathers, for example, in the 300s, the mid-300s, you find Cyril of Jerusalem giving catechetical instructions to new converts in the faith, and he says what you need to do is make a throne for Jesus by putting your right hand on top of your left hand, and then they'll put the Eucharist in your right hand, like a th- like Jesus as king sitting on a throne. So that was how he was instructing his converts to receive the Eucharist back around the year 348. So this is a long-standing tradition in the Church. There may have been a period where it was not the norm, but what would have made it not the norm would have been liturgical law, not some underlying divine principle. So, what we need to do is say, well, what does liturgical law say in our own day? Cy Kellett. Yes, sir. Does liturgical law presently allow the faithful to receive the Eucharist in their hands? It does indeed, yes. It does. So, Litur- the Church's officially approved liturgical law says you can do this, and anybody who's saying you can't is, at best, mistaken, because you can. There's nothing wrong with it. It goes way back in Church history, and Church law expressly permits it. So, um, so, and, and I'll tell you personally, I don't receive in the hand. I receive on the tongue every single time, not because I have to but because that's my preferred spirituality. So if you want to receive on the tongue, Patrick, you're welcome to do that, but don't let anybody tell you you have to, because it's not true that you have to. Well, see, I remember learning that the priest's hands are contrary. And then when I, I left the church for a while, when I came back to the church, 
I did kind of struggle with it, but then I heard you guys say that, what you just said about the early church father mm-hmm. saying how to hold your hand. So then I didn't have a problem with it anymore. But then when she Good. said that the, about the consecration, I remember learning that, that the priest's mm-hmm. hands were consecrated. So... Well, yeah. Well, for- she. It's true that they they have been the, the at least under the old rite of ordination they were consecrated. I'd have to check to see if they still are. But regardless of whether they are or not, she's drawing an erroneous conclusion from that. She is mistaken in the conclusion she's drawing that you shouldn't because church law says you can. Thank you, Patrick. That takes us to the break. Right back with more open forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. Catholic Answers Live will return in a moment. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects homebuyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. One of the biggest mistakes a Christian can make is to try to do good without God's help. St. Therese said, when we trust only ourselves and not God, our soul becomes incapable of virtue. Her remedy, works of charity. And the greatest work of charity is to share the gospel. At St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, we encourage you to share the gospel with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Streetevangelization.com The wisdom of Mother Angelica. Isn't it awesome that we today do not recognize his presence? in the Eucharist? Is it because we really don't go to him in humbleness of heart and say, Lord, I don't believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I want to see you. I want to recognize you. I cannot live without you. Are we saying that? EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live, open forum. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, Alan in Vermont, is next. Alan, uh, thanks for waiting. Uh, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Yeah, so my understanding is that purging yourself is immoral because mm-hmm. it separates the, um, the pleasure of eating, um, say, with the, um, the nutritive aspect of, of eating where, you okay. know, you eat something and, and it can, you know, if you eat too much, it'll make you fat. You've got to deal with the consequences of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, artificial sweeteners, you know, some um, compound that's designed to be, to fool your tongue into thinking you're tasting something sweet like sugar, mm-hmm. and um, those are put in things like soft drinks, um, and... Um, it seems to me that that would fall under the same conditions of, you know, being sort of intentionally non-nutritional where you take the pleasure of drinking a sweet soda without ever having to worry about being fat and deal with the consequences of it. But mm-hmm. I've never heard anyone say that that's immoral. So wh- where am mm-hmm. I going wrong here? Okay, uh, so first of all, I should clarify for the listeners, you know, when you said purging yourself, um, what you were referring to was the kind of purging where you consume a food or drink, and then you f- induce vomiting so that you don't digest it. And this was a practice, for example, that some Romans used. They'd go out, they'd have these elaborate feasts, they'd cram themselves with food, and then they'd go to a special room known as a vomitorium. And they would make themselves vomit, such as by sticking a feather down their throat to cause the gagging reflex. And they would throw up all the food that they had just eaten, and that way they, and then they'd rinse their mouth out, and then they could go back to the feast and eat more. And numerous people look at that and say, "Wow, that's messed up." <laughs> now, um, let I don't. I'd have to. I'd have to debate, is it really messed up? Because there are other situations where um, where one can induce vomiting. You know, if you've if you have uh, if you've eaten something poisonous, for example, yeah, absolutely you can induce vomiting. So there can be reasons that inducing vomiting can be okay. And I can imagine the use of a vomitorium 
being okay in some situations. Like, let's say the mad emperor Caligula wants you to come to his feast and he wants you to eat just as much as he does. Well, okay. Um, you may need to go to the vomitorium in order to be able to keep up with Caligula and he may cut your head off if you don't. So just like you could save your life by vomiting up something poisonous, and that would be legitimate, you could save your life by vomiting up regular food if you're in a situation where Caligula will kill you if you don't. So I, I'd have to think carefully about is, is it actually technically wrong in a particular circumstance? But let's just go with this. Let's suppose it is messed up at least most of the time. Is, is this the same thing as using artificial sweeteners? Well, to approach that question, let's shift it a little bit. Um, Psychelet. Yes, Jimmy. Sugar is commonly used mm -hmm. uh, as a sweetener in soft drinks today, right? Yes. yes. And that's, that's principally what gives them their calories. The sugar that gets used may be of several different kinds because there are different kinds of sugar. Like there's cane sugar, which actually tastes better. And there's table sugar, which is actually a combination of glucose and, and fructose, um, which doesn't taste as good. Um, but uh, there are different kinds of sweeteners you could use. And not all of them are artificial. For example, I drink a soft drink called Zevia. And the reason it's called Zevia is because it's sweetened with stevia. Stevia is a plant from, so it's natural. It's a plant from South America and it's about 200 times sweeter than sugar. So it's a natural substance. Is it immoral for me to use a natural plant like Stevia to make my food sweet? What would you say, Psychology? I can't think of why it would be. I yeah, I can't either. It's a natural ingredient. God created it, you know, it grows. In South America, South Americans can take stevia and mash it up and put it in their food to make it sweet, just like we could, in other parts of the world, take sugarcane and mash it up and put it in our food. It's just a different plant. Mm -hmm. They're both sweet. Um, and so, uh, and, and what we're doing is taking a plant product and putting it in food to make it sweet. In one case, it just happens to have more calories than in the other case. But I'm not thwarting my body's processes by not eating calories. I could completely fast and not eat calories, correct? Sure. Yeah, I know yeah. you do. Yeah. So, um, so, so I'm not doing anything to violate my body by eating low-calorie foods. I could even not eat foods and, 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 and not get calories. Um, and I'm not doing anything wrong by adding a low-calorie natural sweetener to the food compared to a high calorie natural sweetener. I don't have to have calories in it. God made low calorie natural sweeteners I could use, so I can use them. You know, it even says in the Bible, don't call anything God has made unclean. We can give thanks to God for all of them. Well, okay, so if that's the case, then um, could I make a molecule that is like, that has the same effects? as the molecules in stevia. So it tastes sweet, but it doesn't happen to have any calories in it. Well, I don't see why I, not. I don't see why not either. Now, on the other hand, am I so I don't see the I don't see any problem in principle with artificial sweeteners in food. Also, there's another aspect of um, of of taking artificial sodas that we haven't even looked at, which is what are they doing for our bodies? Because there's more that we get from food than just calories. Yeah. We also get – so calories are composed of what are known as macronutrients, things like carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Um, but in addition to needing, to needing macronutrients, we also need what are called micronutrients, things that we need in very small quantities like vitamin C or vitamin D or riboflavin or mm -hmm. zinc or iron. And so we need those as well. And we need something else. And I have a pretty good idea you know or will soon figure out what I'm talking about, Psychelet. We need something else in our diets because it's the principal thing our bodies are made of. Water. Water, yeah. So what's the principal component of 
diet drinks. Water. Water, that's Boom. right. So we actually are receiving nutritional benefit. We're nourishing our bodies when we drink no calorie beverages because and technically they typically actually do have like half a calorie in them but forgetting that we are nourishing our bodies mm -hmm. by drinking beverages that have water in them because water is essential to our bodies so we aren't actually it's not like we're consuming you know iron pellets or something that we can't digest. We are consuming something we digest. It does nourish our bodies. And if we want to make it a little sweetener, a little sweeter using a low calorie natural sweetener or a low calorie artificial sweetener, I don't see anything wrong with that. This is not the same thing as gorging yourself and then forcing yourself to throw up when you don't have a good reason to. All righty. I'm very grateful uh, for the call. Thank you, uh, Alan. I appreciate that. I'm going to try to uh, keep going to get everybody on, but thank you for that uh, call. A an interesting question one I don't remember ever having before. Uh, Bob's in Ohio watching on YouTube. Bob, thank you very much for the call. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Jimmy, what is your take on the multiverse and how does it affect salvation? And B, what's your favorite Ninja Turtle? I'm going to hang up and listen to your answer. <laughs> Well, I have to say I don't have a favorite Ninja Turtle because even though I remember when the comics first started coming out, I didn't read them. And I've never really consumed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle media. In terms of the multiverse, so the idea that there is more than one universe is possible. It even is true if you, depending on how you define universe, for example, angels apparently live in a realm that is not physical. And that would suggest there is a non-physical realm. And if you want to call that a universe, you can. And, uh, and so you'd have at least two universes, the physical universe and a non-physical one. And that would be a kind of baby multiverse. You got two. Um, how does it affect salvation? Now, whether, I should say whether there are any universes beyond those two, I don't know. Maybe but maybe not. I don't think we have scientific evidence one way or another regarding this question. How does it affect salvation? I don't think it does. Now, one could, depending on one's view of the multiverse, get into some interesting areas. Like, let's suppose every time we make a choice, the universe splits into different timelines, and that's how different universes get generated. Well, if that's true, then it would turn out that humans, at least it would seem to turn out, that humans are more complex than what we realize. We think of humans as if they move through reality kind of like a piece of spaghetti, like they're one long line mm -hmm. that ends up in heaven or hell. But if it turned out that, we, that the universe branches with every choice we make, then humans would be more like more like sea coral. You know, if you look at sea coral, how it can have kind of a stem and then it branches and, and keeps branching and can go off in different directions, well, then it would turn out that humans are more like sea coral, that we branch as we make decisions, and some of those choices will lead individual branches to heaven, and some of those choices could lead individual branches to hell. So uh, so that would be a very startling conclusion, but it would seem to follow if it turned out that the universe branches every time we make a choice, which is, as I said, something I have no evidence for. Uh, and I was going to go back to Bob, but I can't go back to Bob. Bob's, uh, I well, hope that's a satisfying answer for you, Bob. I, I could poll the rest of the staff, see if anyone has a favorite Ninja Turtle. I'm sure Andrew has a favorite Ninja Turtle, but I have no idea. What's that? Donatello. All right. So we do have in the building, we have one uh, favorite Ninja Turtle. It is Donatello. At least. Uh, at least, right? Well, I the video department, I just have a feeling about the video department, guys, that each of them probably has. As a matter of fact, I would not be surprised it, to hear that they dress up as Ninja Turtles and each of them has the costume of one of the Ninja Turtles. That would not at all surprise me about the video, guys. Uh, Jimmy, uh, we'll see you again tomorrow here in a, in yeah. a, cer in a certain sense. Uh, in the past. With, yes, I've seen you here tomorrow in a weird kind of way. Uh, yeah. And it'll be weird. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Exactly. Uh, it'll be weird questions with Jimmy Aiken tomorrow, which is always a great way uh, to finish the work week. And so I, we hope you will join us. Uh, check out Jimmy's 
podcast. Everybody else is. Uh, it's Jimmy Ankin's Mysterious World. Just go to mysterious.fm and you can find out all about it. And one more time, I'll say it. Get over yonder to shop.catholic.com where everything's on sale. Store-wide sale. Take advantage of the savings. Shop.catholic.com. See you tomorrow. God willing, right here. Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.